Okay, so here we have two species of my arch nemesis. Not really, but squirrels. Squirrels. And these are two different species. This one you may know is a fox squirrel. Who knows what this one is? Fox squirrels are also sometimes called beefsteak squirrels. If you're squirrel hunting, you want fox squirrels. They're nice. You know, they're about a three, four pound animal, so they dress out at a you know, pound and a half, two pounds of meat. You can you can make a nice pot of stew out of them. This other one, not so much. They're much smaller. What is that other species of squirrel? Who knows? The hints in the color. It's a gray squirrel. It's a gray squirrel. Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, and today is the sixth. That is a gray squirrel. Now, these guys are actually a fantastic example. Um, so competition happens when two individuals want the same things. If you don't want or need the same things as somebody else, you're probably not going to compete a whole lot. Um, I, I know someone who is the youngest of a bunch of kids who, you know, whatever it was that they said, you know, was their favorite cake growing up. And finally, as an adult, they said, you know what, I actually don't, you know, whatever it was, um, pumpkin cake. I actually really don't like pumpkin cake. And the mother said, but you always said it was your favorite. It's what you always wanted for your birthday. And they said, right, that's because nobody else would eat it. So I'd actually get some. And, you know, everybody else likes chocolate cake and banana cake and poppy seed cake. And, you know, I just, I was sick of not getting cake. <laughs> So they picked the one thing that nobody else liked and said, this is my favorite, this is what I want. Just so they didn't have to compete, just so they get some darn cake. Poor youngest child. Um, when there's a big overlap in what you want or need, that's when you have the most intense competition. So, these two species, what do you know about squirrels? Yeah, yeah. What do you know about squirrels? What do they eat? Nuts. Mast, what we call mast in, eco in ecology, um, which is acorns and hickory nuts and walnuts. and I mean, they'll eat other kinds of grain, but they specialize really in hard mast, and that's the nuts that we find in a forest. So they both eat the same things. They're competing head-to-head -head for food resources. Um, they both build leaf nests in the winter. Um, they are both tree dwelling largely. They spend a lot of time up in the treetops. And I always get this wrong. But, okay, let's, let's see if I have this right or not. I don't know if any of you will be able to say, nope, that's backwards, Moser. One of them ends up foraging more on the ground, and one of them ends up foraging more in, in high places up in the trees, which they have done to avoid competition. What do we call that? resource partitioning. Here, you take this bit, I'll take that bit. So, competition definitely changes communities. If you can't compete, if you can't get enough that you need to survive, you die out, you go extinct. Do you remember what this animal is? From the film about whales? Bathylosaurus? big giant predatory whale of the ancient oceans that just couldn't compete and eventually it disappears from the fossil record the community changed because Bathylosaurus could not compete could not get enough food to survive wasn't as good a hunter wasn't as agile wasn't as maneuverable it died out so competition changes communities that that happens so that phenomenon of a species dying out because they can't compete is called competitive exclusion. You saw this in the film with Hank on Friday. Basically, one species, you know, I use the metaphor, voted off the island. They lose. They can't get enough of what they have to have to survive and to sustain their young, so they lose. If we're talking about predators, the more efficient predator wins. And in essence... Remember that we expanded that definition of predator to include herbivores. Everything's a predator. Every species, except plants, every consumer species is a predator of something. So here's the question for you. If we have two species and one is a specialist 
and one is a generalist. Who has the advantage in that competition? Who? Oh, yeah. Generalists tend to do better across the board. They're flexible. They can eat, well, this isn't available, I'll eat that. This isn't available, I'll eat that. Oh, somebody else is active this time of night, well, then I'll be active this time of day. If you are flexible, you, you can succeed where others might go extinct. Humans are, are kind of the ultimate generalist species. We inhabit every, pretty much every part of the Earth. Um, there's no permanent human habitation at Antarctica, but there is in the Arctic. Um, it's pretty amazing. And human diets are varied from people who are vegans to the Inuit who generationally have eaten a diet that's composed almost entirely of animals and fat. I mean, like literally eating dried seal meat and whale blubber, not eating a vegetable, period. For some people, this sounds like a dream come true. I would die without a nice big salad every now and then. Um, you know, that's pretty remarkable flexibility. Humans are a pretty amazing generalist species. So, if you have to compete head to head and you can't kind of veer off to the side and you can only eat one thing and only do things one way, you don't usually make it. So by splitting up the available resources, um, you can end up reducing competition. Yeah, resource partitioning. So when you have similar species that are living close together, um, each only uses part of the resource. And we're going to talk about an example with canids in just a little bit. And I cannot remember what all of these are called. I know this one is the Blackburnian warbler. One of them is... I think this might be the bay-breasted. But anyway, they tend to only hang out in one part of the forest canopy. So, you know, it may be that Blackburnians are near the top on the outside branches, while another species heads for the bottom and takes the whole thing and picks bugs off of it. Um, and most of these are bug eaters. So they're going into trees and looking for insects and harvesting them. And they basically have, for many, many, many generations, stuck to their own sort of neck of the woods because the other part of the tree is already in use. Somebody else is picking the bugs there. Now, could any of them really forage anywhere in the tree? Yeah, but generally, generationally, remember, animals um, can learn behaviors and teach behaviors as well. So, you know, mother and father Blackburnian warblers show their kids, show their offspring, where to look for bugs. Nope, don't go up there. This is where we hunt. Nope, nope, nope. Stay here. Because that's what reduces competition, which means that all five of these species can thrive with a limited number of caterpillars because they're only using part of the resource. What do you know about coyotes? What do you know? Some of you know a lot. What do you know? Um, interestingly enough, no, not really. They usually hunt in pairs. Wolves hunt in packs. So wolves hunt, it depends on how you define pack. Um, coyotes hunt either usually solitarily or in pairs, um, where wolves will hunt in much larger groups, like seven to ten individuals all chasing down game. Let's, let's go back a little bit. Are these herbivores? No. These are obligate carnivores. Actually, a little bit omnivorous. Most canines are slightly omnivorous. Um, who here has a dog who will eat vegetables? Uh, my dear old dog um, loved carrots. She would beg for carrot trimmings, so we always gave her the tops of the carrots that we cut off. Um, most canid species will eat things other than meat, but for the most part, they are largely predators. They're largely carnivorous with some omnivorous tendencies. So, both of them eat meat. Day active, night active, crepuscular. Crepuscular means dawn and dusk active. What do you know? about these guys. Um, coyotes, they're really both wolves and coyotes have 24 hour activity cycles where they have periods of activity and inactivity. Coyotes are mostly thought, especially in the eastern U.S., 
to be crepuscular or nocturnal. So they're more active at night, but they are also day active. It's less common. Um, they avoid predation by their predators, which in the eastern U.S. is mostly humans, um, by being mostly night active. Okay, but they, for the most part, they, they both can, can be active any part of the day. Do we have wolves here? Not in the wild. We used to. We killed them all. Literally killed them all, every single last one. We said we will not stand for any predators other than us, and we killed every single predator there was. That's what we did. Um, go humans. So, we used to have wolves here. We didn't used to have coyotes. But in the western United States, there were both wolves and coyotes. Now, the western coyote was a much smaller species, about 30 pounds, a, a big male. Um, a big male wolf might be 75 or 80 pounds. Um, the timber wolves way in the far north are even larger than that. But, you know, let's, let's think about somewhere in Wyoming 300 years ago. Both coyotes and wolves. Both carnivores. Both canids. Pretty similar in a lot of ways. Um, do live in extended family networks. Wolves tend to live in larger extended family networks where a wolf pack may comprise 20 or 30 individuals. Um, a coyote den might be a mated couple and last year's offspring and this year's pups. So a much smaller group. But a lot of similarities. Does that sound like a recipe for competition? It could be. It certainly could be. How do they avoid that? How do they both continue to live in the same ecosystem? For the most part, where wolves and coyotes ranges overlap, where you have places where wolves and coyotes both live, Wolves are live game hunters. Coyotes are scavengers. Wolves are um, hunting in larger groups. Coyotes are hunting in smaller groups. Wolves are eating elk and deer and larger animals. Coyotes are living on rabbits and mice and chipmunks. Could coyotes go after larger game? Yeah, they could. But doing so means what? It means going head to head with the wolves. When coyotes and wolves actually come into contact, very often the wolves will kill the coyotes. They can't, especially western coyotes, they're little tiny animals. They are not any match for a wolf. And certainly not for a large group of wolves like a wolf pack. Um, the fact that they hunt in, in solitary or, or pairs also um, means they can't, they can't make it out alive, basically. If they have an interaction with wolves where the wolves want to tell them, uh, no, you don't. They don't get out alive. So it's really in the coyote's interest to reduce competition as much as possible. Who's got the bigger in incentive to reduce competition? The person with the weaker hand. If you're the youngest of 10 kids, and you're the slowest, and you're the last of the table, it's in your interest to decide that pumpkin cake's your favorite because nobody else likes it. Because if you try to take on your nine siblings who are bigger and faster than you to fight for the chocolate cake, you're probably going to lose. So the species that has essentially the weaker hand has more of an incentive to say, yeah, you know what, I can do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll eat scavenge. I'll, I'll scavenge. I'll eat rabbits. I'll eat mice. I don't need elk. That's fine. Now, let's talk about this. So this is historical. Um, when Europeans arrived in North America, all of North America was wolf territory. There were wolves along the eastern seaboard. There would have been wolves here. Um, and the coyote was kind of this odd little species that lived out west in the deserts and plains of the west. Um, you would have seen them in, you know, in, in the grasslands of Colorado. You would have seen them in the grasslands of Oklahoma, um, the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona and Texas, southern California. Pro I probably misdrew that. You probably would not 
Well, you might have seen them up into the dry lands of Oregon and Washington, but certainly not the coastal regions. So they were a, a pretty limited species. And there were these big canids all over the continent. Now, why didn't we have coyotes here? Competition was too fierce. Too much comp They couldn't compete with wolves in this environment. They managed to compete. Um, these two species um, both evolved in the, the sort of desert and scrub lands. Um, and I don't know, it'd be interesting to see if there's any evidence that wolves um, evolved in the western U.S. or moved into that niche, in, or into that ecosystem. But the coyotes weren't going to expand into wolf territory. They were hanging on in their own territory by using resource partitioning. And then a funny thing happened. What's the funny thing? Us. We're the funny thing. So European Americans come, and like I said, very intentionally, very intentionally, kill every wolf literally firing into circles that are miles in diameter, killing every predator in their path. Um, read up on the Hinkley Massacre, um, Hinkley, Ohio, where they killed every last living predator in a big, big area. And anyway, ugly stuff. So European Americans come along, and we wipe out all the wolves in the entire western U.S., or, or entire eastern U.S., most of the western U.S., and we basically shrink wolf populations down to something like that. They're reduced to a species that lives uh, mostly in the northern U.S., the wilds of Canada that are not densely settled, um, some areas in Montana and the Dakotas, though actually they're probably extirpated there too. Extirpated means made extinct in a specific area. Well, what does that leave? All oh, this beautiful space right there with no large canids in it. Have you heard the expression, nature abhors a vacuum? What does it mean? You've never heard that? Nature abhors a vacuum. It does not mean a vacuum cleaner. It does not mean the Hoover. A vacuum is something with nothing in it. If there's something with nothing in it, it gets filled up quickly. So there's all this ecosystem here in the eastern U.S. that has no one occupying this niche of relatively large canid predator. We have foxes. Foxes were not extirpated. But there's no bigger canid predator. And we've wiped out mountain lions. And we've wiped out, you know, who would also, they would be a large feline, but they'd be a large predator species. So there's no big predator species there. Hmm. Well, guess what starts to happen? You know the answer to this. You know the punchline. Do we have coyotes in Ohio? Yeah, we've got them in every, every county in Ohio, all 88 counties. That means downtown Cleveland, downtown Columbus, Cincinnati, there are coyotes that wander at night occasionally. And sure enough, what did coyotes do? But they expanded their territory until coyotes are found in pretty much every state in the Union. Um, most parts of all of those states. Why were they able to do that? Coyotes a generalist or a specialist? Oh, they are super generalists. They are amazing generalists. Um, interestingly enough, what we now know is that the coyotes we have, we've, we've said for a long time, eastern coyotes and western coyotes are very different. Western coyotes are pretty small animals, 30, 35 pounds is a huge male. Um, here we can find 75 and 80 pound male coyotes. Um, turns out, as coyotes expanded their range, up in this area, coyote and wolf territories overlapped, and there was a surprising outcome. Instead of it being fatal for one or both parties, you had reproduction occur. And so the western coyote is actually a hybrid animal. It is a slightly different species. It carries a significant portion of wolf DNA. So that coyote that we see out in the wild here in Ohio is, you can call it a koi wolf, you can call it an eastern coyote, you can call it whatever you want. But it's not the same genetically as the western coyote. 
Um, it is different, and it is larger, and it has some traits from each species. So it's sort of this third outcome. We had competition. We had one competitor eliminated. Coyotes didn't kill off wolves in their territory. Humans did it. We had this sort of outside actor that came in and changed the ecosystem and changed the community. And now we have what are the eastern coyotes. And they are different. If you ever travel out west and you get to see coyotes, you'll be shocked at how little and scrawny they look. They look like, you know, somebody's little pet dog. Coyotes we have around here do not. They're substantial. So competition plays out in funny ways. Okay, mutualism. I was surprised that more people didn't see this. I didn't see this on more of the vocab, on the pre-vocab. Um, mutual means what? Both of you. Uh, my daughter and I have a mutual affection for olives. We love olives. She and my husband have a mutual affection for raisins. If you and your best friend have a mutual desire to run a 5K, and so you're training together. Mutual means both of you. Mutualism is a cooperative relationship where both species benefit. And you are one big hive of mutual relationships. All those bacteria on your skin and in your guts, you and them have a great mutualistic relationship going. And there are tons of examples in the natural world we can see for mutualism. Um, so pollinators. There are, interestingly enough, ant farmers. Did you know that? There are ants that actually raise aphids as livestock. It's kind of weird. But they, they sort of farm them. And they protect them from predators. And in, the, in, the, uh, in return, they milk them. There's this sweet, sticky stuff. It's bug poop, basically, that the aphids produce after they've fed on plant juices. And the ants milk them for that. They come along and they harvest it. So there are mutualistic relationships where it's become, over the years, so tightly um, sort of tied together that if one of those species goes extinct, so does the other one. So there are species of bacteria that live only in the human gut. They do not live anyplace else on the planet. If humans went extinct, which could happen, those species of bacteria would also go extinct. Um, there are species of bacteria that live, and especially gut bacteria is a great example because every species that we know of, every warm-blooded species we know of has their own gut bacteria, and if that species goes extinct, their gut bacteria go extinct also, the species of gut bacteria that live there. Um, there are lichen species that only live on certain kinds of trees, similarly. So mutualistic relationships, most, a lot of times we think something's commensal and then we realize after we look at it more, it's actually mutualistic. We'll stop there tomorrow. We're going to talk about commensal relationships and then you will have a quick recall quiz over competition, co competition, mutualism, and commensalism.